Good morning. I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Thank you for those who are joining us online. Uh, as you know, last year we went through the Bible book by book, and this year we're going through the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And so if you're joining with us for the first time, last week would be a good week to jump back online just to get caught up. How many of you guys have ever volunteered for something, anything? How many of you are sitting next to someone who volunteered you for something or anything? Some would call that voluntold. Voluntold. Uh, as a parent, I have been voluntold many times. Dad, my friend, I told my friend that we could pick him up on our way to basketball. Where does your friend live? On the way. Where exactly? I need an address. I put it in the GPS. That's not on the way. That's the opposite of on the way. Didn't you take geography in class? That would be like someone saying, hey, Christopher Columbus, as we're on our way to the Americas, could we stop off at China to get my friend? <laughs> Who is this friend? Ah, it's just some girl. Now I understand. <laughs> now I get it. My favorite place to volunteer is Feed My Starving Children. How many of you have ever been there? Yes, that's, that's us. You can see a bunch of our crew in the background there. In 2021, volunteers packed over 400 million meals. 400 million meals. Children all around the world who got to eat because people volunteered their time and their services. And just like Feed My Starving Children wouldn't exist without volunteers, church would not exist without volunteers. No church would exist without its volunteers. Let's give a round of applause for volunteers. In fact, over the last 2,000 years, the kingdom of God has mostly advanced through volunteers. And not the paid professionals, but through volunteers. I want us to look at Ephesians 2.10 before we get to Luke. It says, For we are God's handiwork or masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And notice this last phrase, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I stand up here with confidence knowing that I'm about to give a sermon that God has prepared me for, that he has prepared you to hear. He has prepared in advance for this moment to take place. I like how it says in Acts 13, 36. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation. Mark Twain once said, there's two important days in your life, the day you're born and the day you discover why you're born. David served his purpose in his generation. He fell asleep and he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. My prayer for all of us is that we would discover God's purpose for our life and that we would lock arms with God and lay our pillow, heads on our pillows at night and know that we do so with confidence that we locked arms with the God of the universe to advance his kingdom on this planet. There are three different types of people. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who say, what happened? <laughs> let's not be a church of people who say, what happened? But well, let's be the type who get involved. Last week we started looking at the Gospel of Luke. We're going to walk through it chapter by chapter. This morning is going to be a little bit different, uh, but you'll understand why. Uh, this morning I want to talk about three volunteers and what they can teach us about advancing the kingdom. And the first one is Elizabeth. Everyone say Elizabeth. <laughs> Luke chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. So we're jumping backwards. Luke chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Everyone say righteous. Observing the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Say blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Notice the four words used to describe Elizabeth. Righteous, blameless, childless, arthritis. They were both very old. They had reached the age of pills and bills. Oh, yeah. Their teeth no longer slept in the same bed as them. They could throw their back out sneezing. They never passed a bathroom without using it. Oh, yeah. They went to more funerals than they did baby showers. 
Does anyone else feel very old this morning? What a description. The reason why this is important is that Luke wants us to understand that this is no ordinary pregnancy, that this is a miracle from God. It's the reason why when Gabriel appears to give this big news to Zechariah, Zechariah's response in Luke 1.18 is, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. He tries to soften the blow a little bit. (laughs) We're getting up there, Gabriel. Now Mary will ask Gabriel a question as well, but there's a slight difference in the nuance. In Luke 1.34 it says, How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Zechariah asks, How can I be sure of this? Mary asked, How will this be? Zechariah wanted proof. Mary wanted a plan. Zechariah wanted proof that this was going to happen. Mary wanted a plan for how this was going to happen. If you were at a local restaurant and you're going through the drive through and you make an order, it is all right to question whether they're going to get it right or not. Because 90% of the time, they're not going to. I'm not going to mention names, but Culver's. I can't tell you how many things there are things missing inside of my Culver's bag. Like I order and there's like zero fries. It's like how out of all these meals, how are there zero fries in here? Or I get chicken rather than a burger or this Coke somehow becomes a tea. If you want to see my wife throw up, have her drink something that she thinks is one thing and it's something else. It's that visceral response. Gabriel is not Wikipedia. He is not full of mistakes. He comes from the presence of God. This news comes directly from the Heavenly Father. And Gabriel saying, I am the only proof you need. The last time I showed up was for Daniel. So what I am bringing you is important. You do not need to question me. And because of this, Zechariah is silenced for nine months. Some of you are like, how can I get Gabriel to watch my kids? He's silenced for nine months. Think about it. Notice that Zechariah's lack of faith didn't stop God's promise or God's plan, but he had to experience it differently because of his lack of faith. And for nine months, the last thing he thought about was the words that he had said to Gabriel, how, will the, or how could this possibly happen? We're old. And Gabriel says, with God, all things are possible. Amen? So he thinks about these words of doubt for nine months, and we need to ask questions And yet, trust God's blessings. For Mary, she wanted to know how this was going to happen. What's the plan, Gabriel? I'm a virgin. All Sunday school kids know the nursery rhyme. So-and-so sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby in a baby carriage. They all know that. For Mary, she's thinking, Angel, you're skipping some steps. I'm not even married yet. I mean, we're engaged, but I'm not married yet. There's some things that need to happen biologically in order for me to have a child. And here's what's interesting. Mary's pregnancy was impossible. Elizabeth's pregnancy was improbable. They were old, but sometimes old people get pregnant. It was improbable. But for Mary, it's impossible. It wasn't logical. It was theological. God had something up his sleeves. I think one of the reasons why Mary will travel 80 miles to go visit with Elizabeth and spend three months' time with her is she needed to get around someone who understood what she was going through. Not just understood the morning sickness and the swollen ankles, but someone who understood what it was like to have an angel visit them and have a miracle baby. Listen to the way that Elizabeth greets Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through 42. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how we're to respond to the presence of Jesus. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, "'Blessed are you among women!' And blessed is the child you will bear. They provided comfort for one another. Comfort, 
and was a, they were blah, 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 blah. they were helping each other to understand God's plan. They didn't try to one up one another. Think about it. She, Elizabeth didn't start off with like, my son is going to be the one who's going to prepare the way for your son. And Mary wasn't like, well, my son's going to be the one to save your son. <laughs> my son's the last Old Testament prophet. Oh yeah, well, my son is the word made flesh. They didn't try to one-up one another. In fact, the word Elizabeth means one who, who keeps God's oaths or God's promises. While John prepared the way for Elizabeth, for, while John prepared the way for Jesus, Elizabeth prepared the way for Mary. She's helping to prepare the way and to bring comfort and encouragement to this young lady. Think about it. Mary lived in Nazareth. Nazareth only had about 2,000 people in a small village. Nobody but Joseph believed her miracle story that she was a virgin who became pregnant, and even Joseph needed an angel to confirm it. He was ready to divorce her. She didn't have a whole lot of support around her. Everyone knew how biology is supposed to work. She was surrounded by negativity. In their article, The Most Dangerous Word in the World, researchers claim that if we were to put you inside of an MRI and we were to flash the word no for just a second, instantly there would be stress-produced hormones going off in your body just by hearing the word no or seeing the word no. These chemicals flood your brain impairing logic, reason, language. Negativity hurts us. We say things like sticks and stones will hurt my bones, but I mean, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Those are lies. Words hurt people all the time. Negative words are difficult to forget. This is why the Bible commands us to encourage one another. It's one of the main reasons why we go to church. Do not neglect getting together so that you may encourage one another. It's the book of Hebrews. Encourage one another. One later asked a simple question that I think all of us should consider. If the people around you, if their nutrients came from the words that you speak, would they be starving or thriving? If the people around you, their nutrients came from your words, would they be starving or thriving? Are you an encourager? Maybe you have the encouragement skills of Wednesday Adams. But it's not too late to change. Being an encourager isn't a suggestion in the Bible. It's a command. We are commanded to encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, which is one of many passages on the subject. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. That is why we gather. Elizabeth hosts Mary for three months. Think about it. That means that she's responsible for feeding her for three months. Elizabeth is old. She's pregnant on top of old, and yet she's taking care of Mary. Mary needs this. She needs someone to come alongside of her and bring some encouragement. As Elizabeth shows that you can never be too old to be used by God. You can never be too old to be used by God. There is no age limit to encouragement. Dave Clark just retired from greeting at the front door. Here's a picture of Dave. Dave just retired from greeting at the front door recently. Now he's just going around and greeting everyone inside. (laughs) It's it's more work, but at least he's warm. (laughs) You You can't get through a Sunday morning without being greeted by Dave. He's still doing it. Listen to the promise in the Old Testament regarding the old. Psalm chapter 92, verse 12 through 15. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. And listen to this. They will still bear fruit in what? Old age. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Some of you need to write that down and read it every morning. I'm going to flourish, be fruitful, even in my old age. We see this in the prophet Anna. Luke chapter 2, verse 36 through 37. There was also a prophet, Anna, 
the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Everyone say, very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. And everyone notice that there's a footnote attached to that 84, okay? She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. The reason why there's a footnote is that in the Greek, it could be that she's 84 at this point, or it could be that she was a widow for 84 years, I want you to think about that. If she was married for seven, and the average girl got married around the age of 13, that meant that she would have been 104 years old in this moment. So either 84 or 104, she's put in a lot of miles. And the moment in which she gets put into the Bible, the moment where she encounters Jesus, the moment that is most significant either happens at 84 or triple digits. You can never be too old to be used by God. Stop thinking your best days are in the rearview mirror and say like Paul, outwardly maybe I'm wasting away, but inwardly I am renewed day by day. I can still be used by God. I can still be an encourager. You may retire from your job, but you cannot retire from ministry. Ministry will go with you to the day you take your last breath here and your first breath in eternity. Amen? Next, Mary. Everyone say Mary. Mary. Luke mentions Mary more than any of the other gospel writers. Mary is the name that is repeated most in the New Testament. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned 19 times. There is a lot of confusion surrounding Mary. The apocryphal book of James, which was written in the second century, Said a lot of things about Mary that are not true, but we see got picked up by the Catholic Church. In it, it says that she was a perpetual virgin who spent the first three years of her life living in the temple being fed by angels. That sounds nice. And somehow managed to give birth in a barn without an ounce of pain. That's not biblical. The real Mary was between 13 and 16 years old when she became pregnant with Jesus, and she experienced pain. It was not a pleasant experience. Girls typically got engaged around the age of 12 and then married at the age of 13. But as we said at the Christmas Eve service, we know that Mary showed a lot of maturity. She is called by the angel Gabriel, highly favored. The only time where this phrase is used in the Bible. It's significant. She quotes from the Old Testament ten times when she freestyles her song of worship. She knows scripture really well. And she travels to visit Elizabeth, which was about 80 miles most likely with a caravan. She shows some maturity. And she speaks one of the most mature responses to the angel Gabriel. Listen to it. Luke 138. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. If only Zechariah would have responded that way. Zechariah responds with doubt and has silence. Mary responds with faith and has worship. Mary shows us that you can never be too young to be used by God. Elizabeth shows you can't be too old. Mary shows us that you can't be too young to be used by God. Samuel was around the age of 11 when he heard the voice of God for the first time. Around the age of 11. Josiah was 8 when he became king over Israel. And what's significant is he's one of the few kings in the Old Testament where the phrase is used that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. David was called, as, called a boy when he went up against the giant Goliath. We don't know his exact age, but estimates put him at around 15 when Samuel came and anointed him as king. Joseph was 17 when he received a dream or vision from God and how he would help out Israel. While we could talk about many contributions from Mary, I want to focus on one phrase that she says over and over again. But I want us to do so knowing that you can never be too young to be used by God. It's a phrase that appears twice, Luke 2.19, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And it's going to get used again, Luke 2.51. Then he went down to Nazareth, 
with them and was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Notice that phrase, treasured these things in her heart. How many of you struggle to remember names? I saw a funny meme this week that I think represents us well. It says, my brain, when someone tells me their name for the first time, and here's the picture, it's a copier up top and a shredder underneath. So as soon as the paper comes out, it just gets shredded, and that's how people you know, feel when they try to remember names. Some of you are like, yes, that is the perfect meme for me. Maybe you feel like Dory in Finding Nemo, or 10 Second Tom from 50 First Dates. Names are slippery. The human brain has 86 billion neurons, and yet we forget 70% within 24 hours, which is job security for me. <laughs> for example, when asked how many animals did Moses take on the ark, most people say two. But the correct answer is none because it wasn't Moses. It was Noah. <laughs> but names are slippery. <laughs> We get it jumbled in our brains all the time. According to psychology professor Paul Reber, our brains have the capacity to hold up to 2.5 petabytes of data. 2.5 petabytes of data. To give you an understanding, that would be like the latest iPhone having 4,000 of those iPhones worth of memory. Your brain has an amazing capacity for memory, and yet most of us feel like we have the brain of a flip phone. I don't know where where all the rest of that memory went, but I sure don't have it. As Christians, we are encouraged to memorize Scripture, something that has gone out of practice in recent history. To memorize Scripture, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This isn't being said to pastors or teachers. It's being said to the community. And it's saying if we're going to teach each other and encourage each other and help each other, we're going to have to let Christ's words dwell in us richly in order for that to happen. Jesus says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we're letting his words dwell within us richly, then it will become a part of our natural conversation. Chuck Swindoll said that the most important thing you can do as a Christian is memorize scripture. The reason why is because it's going to strengthen your prayer. It's going to sharpen your witness. It's going to change your attitude and outlook on life, and it's going to give you confidence and faith when it comes to the things that you're going through. Your faith will be solidified by the words. Our thoughts are to be shaped by God's thoughts. It is believed that Luke got all of these stories about Jesus' childhood from Mary. That's why he's using this phrase that she treasured these things up in her heart. He got to sit down with her and he got these stories directly from her. It is believed. In fact, he is the only one to share with us a story from Jesus' childhood when he was 12. And Mary and Joseph lost him. Could you imagine losing the Son of God? There's a reason why Mary remembered that story. Oh, I've got a story for you. When Jesus was 12, it would have been traumatizing. But like Mary, we need people who are willing to treasure up the word of God, to memorize scripture, to treasure it, to ponder it, and to share it with others. Memorizing scripture has been a GPS in my life. For example, every winter I ask myself, why do I live in Wisconsin? Why do I live in a state where you can be frostbitten and sunburnt in the same week? Or you can see a person walking around with their dog inside of a stroller. I'll show you a picture. So that the paws don't get cold. Aww, that's ridiculous. There are times when I ask myself, why do I live in Wisconsin? I'm not built for winter. I don't have the natural insulation for it. But then I challenged myself with the thoughts of the first scripture that I ever memorized, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. When I want to buy a one-way ticket to anywhere close to the equator, anywhere, anywhere, I challenge my thoughts and feelings with God's thoughts. He promises to direct my path. In fact, I love that phrase, he will make your path straight. 
Everyone say that with me. He will make your path straight. In Hebrew, the idea of, is of a path being cleared for you. If you go straight in any direction, eventually you're going to run into an obstacle. If I walk straight right now, I'm going to run into Keith. And one of us is going to fall down, and I guarantee it will be me. God says that if you walk, he's going to clear your path. God promises to help us with these obstacles. The first Tough mutter I ever did, there was a wall just to get into the race. And this poor lady couldn't get over the initial wall. She looked like a Keebler elf and her feet were dangling. It's like, man, if you can't get over the first wall, this is going to be a tough race for you. But her team came along and they helped her over that wall. God doesn't promise to remove all obstacles. He promises to help you get through those obstacles. Maybe you'll face a lion's den like Daniel. Maybe you'll face a fiery furnace like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but God will be in the midst of it with you. He will help you through those circumstances. He will make your path straight. Solomon's dad put it like this, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me to green pastures. Sheep only see about 15 feet in front of them. They don't have great eyesight. In Israel, there were no grassy fields like you see in the Shire and the Lord of the Rings, but rather there were patches of grass throughout. So sheep can eat two to four pounds of grass in a day. So they had to rely on the shepherd to get them to those various grassy patches in order to be able to eat for the day. They had to rely on the shepherd. I didn't choose Wisconsin. I chose God, and then God chose Wisconsin. Now, <laughs> thank you. Now, there might come a time when he doesn't choose Wisconsin, and I will say, hallelujah! But it might be Alaska. But it might be Alaska, and then I will not be saying hallelujah. <laughs> I'll be saying, I am the Lord's servant. <laughs> May it be to me as your word says. <laughs> but for now, this is where I have been assigned, just like God assigned land for the, each of the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm going to show you a picture. They didn't get to choose where they lived. He chose for them where they lived. And look where the tribe of Dan is. It's all the way up in the north. It's a flyover state. Dan's probably, I want to live in the south. He's like, no, this is where I'm putting you. God chose Wisconsin for me. When my wife and I got married, we wanted to move to North Carolina. That was our destination. Why? Because the Wright brothers took their first flight there, and that's where Krispy Kremes were invented, both equally important. <laughs> but God had other plans. In fact, I didn't live in, if I didn't live in my house in Kenosha, then I wouldn't have been there the day that a pastor went knocking door to door trying to find people to come to his church, and then I became friends with him, and then when we got kicked out of the school and we did the spiritual thing of panicking and we didn't know what was going to happen, I called him up, hey, can we rent some space? And in that moment, he happened to be quitting his job, and then we got to move in without having to rent space, and the keys were given to us all because I lived in stupid Wisconsin. But that never would have happened without being obedient to God's direction. And here's the point. I have had to use scripture over and over and over to direct my path, and I'm glad that I do. And that needs to be the heartbeat, not only of us individually, but of us corporately. Our church needs to be guided by the word of God, which is why we're spending this time in Luke and Acts, which is 27% of the New Testament. Amen? Amen. All right, third, Magdalene. Everyone say Magdalene. Magdalene. Who does Jesus appear to first after the resurrection? Mary Magdalene. Not his enemies, not his inner circle, scary Mary. To understand why I say that phrase, we need to look at Luke chapter 8, verse 1 through 2, and Luke is the only one who gives us some backstory to Mary Magdalene. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, called Magdalene, that's not her last name, it's where she grew up, from whom seven demons had come out. Mary Magdalene used to be possessed not by one demon, 
Not two demons. Not three demons. Seven demons. That's like the clown car of demons. That is a, <laughs> that is a lot of demons for one person. <laughs> I broke Suzanne. Elizabeth shows you can't be too old to be used by God. Mary shows that you can't be too young to be used by God. Magdalene shows that you can't be too far gone from God to be used by God. If God can take someone full of seven demons and completely turn their life around, there's hope for you. God can turn your life around. Listen to how Mary responds to the freedom that Jesus gives. Chapter 8, verse 3. These women, including Mary Magdalene, were helping to support them on their own means. These women financially supported the ministry of Jesus. Jesus and the disciples were able to go from town to town to town because of these women. Yes. Here's what's interesting about Luke. Luke is going to talk about women more than any of the other gospel writers. When you read the Gospels, you'll see a lot about the 12 apostles. And one of the reasons why is because they represented the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the new Israel, the church. But what Luke wants us to know is that the church would not exist without women. Without Elizabeth, you don't have John the Baptist. Without Mary, you don't have Jesus. And without Mary Magdalene, these other ladies, then Jesus and the disciples couldn't travel from town to town to town pushing forth the kingdom of God. It is a partnership between men and women making the church a reality. Amen? Amen. Women help to advance the kingdom of God. Last week we talked about our bathroom remodel. We talked about how we want to be great hosts and the bathrooms looked like they were built in the 1960s and it looked like a, a truck stop. So we're renovating them. And last week we talked about how we'd already raised $6,000 and that was just in our initial push, our initial drive. Each toilet paper roll represents $1,000. So let's see where we're at now. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, $15,000. That's amazing. And my favorite story is at our prayer meeting this last week, a lady who used to attend our church in person, but then COVID happened and she's had some health problems. She's had to watch from home, watches every Sunday. But she came out to the prayer meeting just so she could hand deliver her $100 to help out with this process. Love it. Love it. My, aunt, my wife asked one of our sons recently, did you brush your teeth? He said, Yes. And she said, how, when your toothbrush is sitting in my handbag? <laughs> to which he said, I use dad's. <laughs> I almost threw up. I didn't because I didn't have a clean brush to use to brush my teeth out after I threw up, so I had to hold it back. Some things are sacred. <laughs> a man's toothbrush is sacred. Joshua chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and their articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When we use the money that God's blessed us with to advance the kingdom of God, it goes from secular to sacred. When we put it into his hands, they say that cash is some of the dirtiest things on the planet. They're, they're, it's gross. But when we put it into God's hands, it becomes sacred. Amen? Amen? These three volunteers, Elizabeth, Mary, and Magdalene, show us that you can never be too old to be used by God. You can never be too young to be used by God. And you can never be too far from God to be used by God. And I want to end with two quotes. One, if you don't believe that one person can make a difference... You've never been in a bed with a mosquito. 
And number two, don't ever question the value of volunteers. Noah's Ark was built by volunteers. The Titanic was built by professionals. <laughs> My challenge to you this week is to memorize Acts chapter 2, verse 47. So we talked about the importance of memorizing Scripture, so I'm going to challenge you to memorize Acts 2.47, which is our theme verse for the year. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and it's on your paper to make it easy. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice that it's not just about numerical growth. It's about spiritual growth. He added to the church daily those who were being saved. God wants to reach out to this community through you, through me, and see people's lives transformed and lives saved to accept Christ as Savior, as Savior and Lord. And he does through, through volunteers like you and me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the volunteers that you have used to make your kingdom a reality. God, we thank you for the Elizabeth, Mary, and Magdalene who were obedient to your voice. And God, we pray that you would help us to do the same, to say like Mary, I am the Lord's servant. I will gladly go where you tell me to go, say what you tell me to say, and do what you tell me to do. We thank you, God, for it's all about you and your kingdom. In your name, amen.